All right, welcome everybody to the info session on international fellowships. Uh, my name is Heidi Bretz. I use she, her pronouns, and I'll be leading you this evening in the wonderful world, into the wonderful world of, world of fellowships. And what my role is, is to serve as an advisor for folks who are applying for these international opportunities. Um, so I hope to work with all of you at some point to find funding to help you do research, study abroad, or do graduate programs or other things um, with a global event. So as we go along, um, I will be uh, asking questions of you. We are gonna start with an icebreaker. So feel free to drop any questions you have into the chat. So we're gonna start with an icebreaker, talk a little bit, bit about what are fellowships, selected fellowships overview, particularly international ones, that's why you're here. We'll talk a little bit about what makes a good applicant, We'll hear from someone who has recently returned from an international fellowship, so you don't just have to take my word for it. And then we'll talk about what's next. How can you get started once you have an interest and have some information about which fellowships might be right for you? So let's start off with um, a little bit of an icebreaker. So go ahead and type in the chat. If I gave you a plane ticket, hotel and all of that, to, uh, and you could hop on a plane tomorrow, where would you go and why? And then just for some inspiration, these are some of our uh, folks who have gone abroad on international fellowships. So where would you go and why? All right, Croatia, because it's beautiful. Yeah, I've heard really good things about Croatia. It's kind of an up and coming destination. New Zealand, also very beautiful. I'm feeling a lot about Dorsey people. Ooh, China or Taiwan, um, improving language skills. Awesome. Mm. Japan, because you've always wanted to go. Awesome. Um, Jordan to see Petra. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I've actually been there. Spain, haven't been there. It's practice my Spanish. Iceland, oh man, I would love to go there. <laughs> yeah, Petra is huge. Bring your, bring your hiking boots. Awesome. Well, I'm happy to uh, let you know that some of these things, or maybe even um, all of these things, can be possible with funding uh, from international fellowships. So how can you get started? Um, I don't know if anyone has a guess at what a fellowship is, but whenever I um, think of fellowships, oh, Jamaica, culture and beaches, awesome. So whenever I think of fellowships, because I'm a nerd, I think of the Fellowship of the Ring. And so um, we found this tweet from uh, Twitter, rest in peace. But um, it says, you want me to apply for a fellowship after what happened to Baromir? I don't know if anyone remembers, but Baromir is this guy. He did not have a great time on his fellowship. Um, but that is not something that we're hoping for you. Hopefully your fellowship will not involve you full of arrows. So a fellowship is uh, a nationally competitive award, a merit-based award that gives you funding to do certain activities. So when we say nationally competitive, what do we mean by that? So that means that this is open, the, whatever fellowship you're applying for is open to students from all over the US. Some of them are even international, but students from outside of USC can apply. This is not coordinated by USC. It's different from financial aid or scholarships that are part of um, being at Carolina. These are coming from outside. So the government, foundations, um, even other nations' governments are giving money to students to do cool things. So they're not coordinated by USC. And competitive can be a word that's a little bit scary, uh, but competitive in this sense really is more about finding your fit. Which fellowship are you best suited for? Um, for me, for example, if I applied for the DAAD RISE, which we're talking about later, I would probably not get it because I... And not a STEM person. I don't do STEM research. So that wouldn't be a good fellowship for me to go to Germany and do STEM research for a summer. Um, something where I could learn French or Arabic would be much more kind of my speed. So competitive is all about finding which program is going to be the best fit for you. And then we can help as a staff, um, as a team of advisors to help you apply for these awards by uh, reading over your essays, helping you brainstorm, uh, help you think through who you'll ask for recommendations, practice for interviews, all that support all the way up to and even after you submit an application. 
And there are quite a few of these awards. There are over 250 that we have in our database. And so that can be a little overwhelming. So what we do as a team is we help you to, again, comb through those different opportunities and really find which one is going to be the best fit for you. So what is a fellowship? We've covered national, what's a fellowship? So a fellowship is an award or an opportunity. It's a source of funding that connects you to different experiences. So that can include college tuition, so help pay your, your time here at USC, international experiences, which, which is what I assume y'all are here to learn more about, research, which again can overlap with international, um, internships, summer programs, even pay for graduate school. So fellowships are pools of funding to help you do cool things. Nationally competitive means that you are applying along with a bunch of other people um, for these awards. Competitive means that unfortunately they can't give it to everybody else that they would like to. So how can you um, best communicate why you're interested in the award and how it would benefit you so that you have a chance of potentially um, earning an opportunity to travel or do research or um, other cool things. All right. So just like a Frodo in the Fellowship of the Ring, to continue the metaphor, you don't have to do this alone. You have a team of advisors, of friends and family, um, professors that you work with that you can call upon when you are undertaking a fellowship. So use your resources. You have the National Fellowships team. We often abbreviate ourselves NF. Um, there are five different uh, advisors in our office, all specializing in something a little different. I specialize in international awards. We also have advisors who specialize in first and second year awards. So if you're just starting your college journey, um, you can talk with Val Weingart. If you're interested in STEM opportunities, Chastity Graham is going to be the person you'll connect with. Um, my uh, Our director, Jen Bess, is in charge of the um, UK awards. So Marshall, Mitchell, Rhodes, if you've heard of any of those big names, um, ready to go to the UK for graduate school. She's the person who can help with that, as well as uh, Truman, which is a public service award. And then if you are looking towards graduate school, Matt Klopfenstein specializes in graduate award funding. So you have this team here for you. We're included with your tuition. We are free of charge to you um, as an undergraduate, a graduate student, and even as an alumni. You can still come back and use our services as long as you're not attached to a university that would be better poised to help you. Um, you have your faculty. Um, I don't know how many people have started building those relationships with faculty, but they're really interested in sharing their knowledge with you and supporting you and seeing you grow. So they are part of your fellowship, as it were. Um, you have fellowship peer mentors, where he'll, we'll hear from one of them later. And they are folks who have been there, done that. They've applied for these fellowships. They've received these fellowships. And they are ready to talk to you. And also, our office will pay for coffee for you to talk to them. So definitely take advantage of those. Some of our applications have committees, um, so committee members, campus partners, friends and family. There are tons of people here who are supporting your journey with applying for these national fellowships. So why should you apply for a fellowship? Well, potentially you can get funding, but why else? What can the process of applying for a fellowship do for you? We really focus on the value you get out of the application itself, because again, we can't control the outcome. We're not making decisions, you're not making decisions, but what we're doing is helping you to put forth your best application. And that actually comes with a lot of benefits in and of itself in preparing a fellowships application. So first off, clarifying your goals and areas of interest. Um, a fellowship application is a deeply reflective process. You'll think about um, what your values are, what your professional goals are, your personal, your academic, um, you'll think about how everything in your life has kind of fit together so far and how it's going to bring you forward into the future and how the fellowship can help you do that. So it's a lot of deep reflection and will help you with that process, but it'll help you clarify. And then also, once you've clarified what your goals are, it will help will help you to articulate those goals, academic, personal, professional. Um, Writing for fellowships is a little bit different than writing a paper for your classes. So we're here to help you kind of find your voice and communicate your authentic story within um, the guidelines of what the fellowship is hoping to learn about you. So really getting better and strengthening your writing skills. Again, strengthening your persuasive, persuasive writing skills, developing materials that you can adapt for other purposes. Um, so if you're planning to go to graduate school, if you're applying for a job, a lot of these cover letters, personal statements, 
those are all things that once you start writing them, you can adapt and tweak and reuse for other purposes. So again, the, the time that you put into these fellowships is rarely wasted. Um, and then building your campus and community networks. So this will be, again, where your faculty will come in, where those campus partners will come in, and really building strong relationships with those faculty members, getting to know them, telling them about your interests, learning more about theirs, and that can help you to build your professional network so that if you, in the future, um, are looking for job opportunities or if you are looking for legislative recommendation, you have faculty on your side who are ready to reach out to their friends and their friends and their friends, and who knows where that will take you. So building those community networks is really important. And you can do that through fellowships. Getting individual guidance from those faculty as well. And of course, um, possibly getting funding to do cool things. This is the last thing on the checklist. Again, we can't control the outcome. All we can control is the amount of time and effort and reflection we put into these applications. And hopefully at the end, profit. So what can you do with an internationally focused fellowship? So study abroad, of course, is one, but there are many other ways that you can take your learning abroad. So you can develop language skills or regional, regional expertise. I know we had folks who are interested in practicing their Spanish, their Mandarin, um, who are interested in kind of connecting with your heritage in Jamaica or with um, family that's traveled before. So really developing those, those, expertise, those expertises in different um, areas. Again, building your professional and personal networks outside of the United States, especially for those who are going into like STEM or um, any type of a research career, you're probably going to be collaborating internationally at some point. And this is a great way to get started building those professional networks. You can pursue specific academic opportunities. So if there is, a, for example, um, in Iceland, if you want to go to Iceland, um, maybe there is a whole master's program on um, geothermal energy that you can't really find anywhere else, then you can make a good argument for, hey, I need to go to Iceland to study geothermal energy. It's the only place they offer this program. Great. You can find those specific academic opportunities or maybe even research with a specific professor or with top scientists. Um, and again, we'll hear more about that from our fellowship peer mentor. You can develop a global perspective on local issues. Um, the world is increasingly connected, increasingly globalized, and it's really important to be able to look through the, through things, uh, look at things through multiple lenses. Again, especially as you move through your academic career, as you move into the professional world, um, these are going to be really uh, key skills, soft skills um, that employers are looking for. Is folks who are able to see things through multiple perspectives, interact with folks who are from different backgrounds. You could potentially teach English um, with or without a teaching degree. So it depends on kind of what your interests are. Prepare for the career or career in the Foreign Service. If that's something of interest to you, there are fellowships, a lot of fellowships specifically for the Foreign Service. Um, you can practice international policymaking and more. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do an internationally focused fellowship. So again, there are a lot of intersections. And again, we'll, we will meet with you. And the point of our meeting is to really figure out what you're interested in, what makes you passionate, what kind of experiences you wanna have, and then bring it all together by finding your fit. So um, with that, I am going to launch just a quick little poll. And I really just wanna know about just a couple things about you. So can you share what year in school you are that will really help me to um, determine kind of which fellowships to focus on for our time today. Awesome. Hmm. All right, y'all are fast. Oop, had somebody change. Okay. All right, so it looks like, um, share the results in case you're interested. Um, so we have a lot of uh, first and second year students, um, quite a few juniors and a few uh, seniors or graduate students. So that helps me um, to know which kind of awards to um, highlight for you all. Because again, one of the common questions we get from, from fellowships is, when do I get started? There's never really a bad time to get started, but again, depending on what you're interested in, um, there may be certain awards that are only available in your first or second year or only available to graduate students. So it's a good idea to meet with us early because then you have the most options um, when it comes to applying for these types of fellowships. So 
Okay, so for our, um, these kind of apply to everybody. This is an everybody award. So if you are interested in critical need language study, so I heard Mandarin, um, Spanish doesn't count as a critical need language study, but don't worry, we'll come to um, some fellowships that are good for you. But I heard Japanese, if you're thinking, excuse me, um, of doing African languages like Swahili or Zulu or Wolof, um, if you are thinking of studying indigenous languages um, in South America or things like Hindi, Urdu, um, born in CLS can be really great opportunities to fund that kind of study. Uh, CLS, Critical Language Scholarship, is actually the fellowship that I did when I was in college, when I was in your shoes, and I studied Arabic um, for a summer in Tunisia, and I went from not being able to read or I didn't know any Arabic, and I came out with an intermediate speaking um, reading and writing proficiency. So it will, it's kind of a kick butt program, eight to 10 weeks, very intensive language learning, um, but you will learn that language. Um, it's a really great opportunity for folks who really want to get a jump start on their language learning. For many of those um, languages, they offer 15 critical need languages. Most of them, they don't have a prerequisite. So Portuguese, Swahili, Urdu, Bahasa Indonesian, you don't have to know any of the language before you actually go to go on the critical language scholarship. Um, you have to make the, an argument again for why this particular fellowship is gonna prepare you for your next steps. So that's a summer program. And there's also BORIN. So if you're looking at um, a little bit longer in country, especially if you're a first or second year, your junior year is a great year to kind of target for study abroad. And you can apply for BORIN um, the spring of your sophomore year. For those who are seniors kind of looking towards graduation, there are opportunities for um, students to take an additional year um, as a senior and potentially um, go abroad for a year. And both of these are open to graduate students as well. Um, but the BORIN is more of a longer term commitment, 12 to, 20, uh, 12 to 52 weeks abroad, up to $25,000 to help you um, fund your studies. And that is critical need languages and you don't have to have any um, previous experience with the language. So really exciting stuff. And for those of you who are interested in working for the federal government, a lot of these um, are government funded. Not all of them have what they call a service opportunity, which is like a commitment that you make to um, work for the government for a certain amount of time. CLS does not, but they do give you like an edge up in hiring. Um, and Boren does have a one-year service commitment. So if you're already thinking about federal government work, this is a great way to get your foot in the door. So for those of you who are looking to study abroad, um, kind of, in East Asia are the first couple and then the whole world are the other two. These are really great programs for uh, scholarships for programs of your choosing. So if you're eligible for Pell Grants, Gilman is gonna be your best bet. Um, we're actually doing a Gilman workshop later this week, Thursday at one o'clock, again on Zoom. And so that offers up to $5,000 for study abroad of any length, as long as it's credit bearing and you are Pell eligible. So if that is you, please apply for Gilman. Um, the FEA, Fund for Education Abroad, is similar to Gilman. It does ask the um, applicants specify their financial need, but it's not tied to Pell eligibility. But that one is open to programs of, I believe, of any length. I think they, they got rid of their length requirement. Um, so check those two out if you're planning to go abroad for any length of time. Um, any location, they are pretty flexible, especially Gilman. If you start off applying for Spain and then you realize that you wanna to go to Peru instead, they're pretty flexible about changing that as well, which is great. Gilman's like my favorite. So please apply for that if you're eligible. Freeman Asia, um, I don't know how many of you are in the business school, but this can be a little bit confusing. The business school has its own Freeman award, which is similar to the Freeman Asia, but you can't get both. Um, but Freeman Asia is for students who are studying abroad um, for, I believe, six weeks or more in an East Asian country. And again, this is funding to help you study abroad. Bridging is specifically for folks going to Japan. So whoever I had um, who said they wanted to go to Japan, bridging, a great one to keep in mind. And these are all for scholarship programs of your choosing. And then again, we'll talk about this later, but the DAAD RISE actually is an eight to 10 week summer research internship in Germany, fully funded. You get to research with PhD students at top German universities. You don't have to speak German, it's a plus, um, but you can actually apply to up to three different um, STEM research opportunities. And then if you're selected, you get to participate on one of those for the coming summer. Erasmus Mundus, for those of you who are looking towards graduation. Oh, before I do that, 
Uh, these ones, again, the three or three bullet points, which contain more than three awards, but these awards are open for um, folks who are kind of newer in their academic career. So Boren and CLS, um, you can apply for those as a first year student. Um, Boren, again, you're, you're kind of have to plan ahead for that one, but for CLS, you can apply as long as you are an enrolled student at the time of application. So that includes right now, um, the deadline's coming up in November. So if you are a first year student, you can apply for CLS. If you are a PhD student, you can apply for CLS or anywhere in between as long as you're engaged in a full-time program of study. For Boren, you do have to be a current matriculated student, so you do have to be in the course of your program. You can't apply like for the summer after you graduate with some caveats, so talk to me about that. Um, Bridging Freeman Asia, FBA Gilman, those again, as long as you are an undergrad, you'll be eligible for those and whatever other criteria you would need to meet. DAD RISE is for sophomores and juniors. So if you're a sophomore or junior, great time to apply for the DAD RISE. So looking towards the future, so for those of you who are juniors, seniors, or even folks who are planning real far ahead, um, there are programs that fund graduate study as well. So Erasmus Mundus actually funds two one-year master's degrees in several European countries. So you can um, browse their catalogs, search from around all their different um, interdisciplinary awards. They're really cool. And you would come out of that with two one-year master's degrees. Pretty awesome. Fulbright is another great uh, postgraduate opportunity. And you can apply for this anytime from the, like after you graduate with your bachelor's all the way through the conferral of a PhD. So as long as you don't have your PhD after you graduate, you can still come back um, and do Fulbright and we can help again, as long as you're not associated with another university that would be better poised to give you assistance. You can come back five years down the road and say, hey, I really wanna go teach English in Mongolia. And we'll say, great, we'll help you with your application. But Fulbright gives you basically a year of funding to teach English, do research, go to graduate school or do a creative arts project in another country. And just to confuse you, there is also Fulbright UK, which is a three to four summer program, uh, three to four week summer program at a UK university. I think they have like usually five or six different opportunities. And that is only for first and second year students. So the two thirds of you who are uh, coming into this as first or second year students, um, Fulbright UK is one to look at. They actually want students who have not traveled extensively. So if you've been outside of the US for less than five weeks, check out Fulbright UK. Um, that's a really great program to, um, again, introduce you to the UK, uh, do some interdisciplinary study, and get get a little taste of traveling. It's a really great award. And to continue, um, for our juniors, you are actually in the, the perfect time right now to apply for a PPIA, which is Public Policy and International Affairs. There are a lot of acronyms here. Um, and so that is a summer institute, seven weeks to focus on public policy and international affairs. So if you're thinking of going to graduate school for public policy or international affairs, this is basically a boot camp to get you ready. So if that's in your in your plan, this one is a great one to apply for and only juniors can do the, the full summer institute. Weekends are open to other folks so you can do some kind of shorter experiences. But if you're interested in kind of a real boot camp, um, definitely apply for PPA. It's due on November 1st. So please come talk to me if you're interested. Um, again, kind of planning a little bit more long term. Pickering, Wrangell, Payne are fellowships that fund a two year domestic graduate program in the US, and then they give you a path into the Foreign Service. So as long as you complete all the requirements, you you get a job basically at the end of this one um, in the Foreign Service with either the US Department of State or USAID, which does more development work. Um, and this one you would apply for your senior year or as an alumni. So if anyone is a computer science major or wants to do IT and also is interested in diplomacy, there actually is a specific um, foreign affairs IT fellowship called FATE, and that will fund either the last two years of your um, undergraduate degree here. So if you're doing like cybersecurity or computer science or, or system engineering or something along those lines, and you want to work for the foreign service, great opportunity. You can apply as a sophomore or as a graduating senior or alum. The Wrangell Summer Enrichment, kind of like PPIA, this one is a summer program that is for undergraduates who are interested in the Foreign Service. So this is kind of to um, help you get ready and kind of figure out if that's the path you wanna take. Um, it's a really great opportunity. 
Um, again, sophomores, juniors can apply for this one. Looking again towards graduate school, Rhodes, Marshall, Mitz Mitchell, Gates, Cambridge, those are all um, programs for graduate study in the UK. So if you have your heart set on um, specific universities within the UK, these are kind of the big, the big fellowships that can help you get there, along with others like Fulbright. Just kind of depends on what you're most interested in. And then finally uh, for today, the Rotary Global Grants. This is another one that I work with that's really um, an exciting opportunity. And that funds one year of graduate study abroad um, to the tune of like thirty to $45,000 for you to go abroad and do graduate study in one of seven different um, areas of focus, environments, um, health and disease prevention, community um, and economic development, teaching, there are a whole different, a whole lot of different um, areas that you can focus in. And that one you would apply actually the spring of your junior year. So juniors, if you're thinking of what am I gonna do after graduation, this could be an opportunity. So please come talk to me. And this one's all about building relationships with um, Rotary Clubs, which are basically um, community service clubs that are all around the world doing good, um, eradicating polio, that type of stuff. Um, so really great people to work with and Global Grant will help you to connect with people again around the world and build your network. Okay, so I'm gonna do this slide and then I will pause for questions and then we'll transition to the student voices um, part of our presentation. So what makes a good fellowship applicant? When we think about this, um, we're not necessarily like looking for 4.0 honor students, although of course 4.0 honor students do often make really good fellowship applicants, but it's more than that. Um, they are looking for a genuine interest in other cultures, languages, and perspectives. So why are you interested in going to Spain? Why do you wanna learn um, Spanish? Maybe you want to be a physician and you wanna be able to talk to your patients in their language. Awesome. Uh, those are the kinds of things they wanna hear about is where did this interest come from? What are you hoping to do with it? They do want you to have solid academics. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily translate to a certain GPA. Many of these um, fellowships don't even have a GPA requirement. Some of them do, but not all of them. Um, but they're really looking for you to have solid academics in your area of focus. If you're a math major, like statistics, you should probably have pretty good grades in that. Um, English or history, they can be a little more forgiving. So again, kind of thinking about your area of focus. Thinking about your leadership experience. How have you been a leader? And that, again, can look a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be tied to a specific position name or a specific um, club that you're a part of. It can be maybe you're a leader for your siblings and maybe you take a really proactive role in helping to um, raise them or take care of them. Um, maybe you are working an, an after like a part-time job or a full-time job. I've run into people who do a full-time job and full-time school and honestly like I would give them all the fellowships because I'm not sure how they do that um, and still like manage to to come in with a smile on their face. You can think about um, times you've been leaders in the classroom, if you're doing research, this can look a lot of different ways. You also wanna show cultural humility and empathy. So really that interest in building relationships, in learning about other cultures, and really being able to empathize with people whose life experiences may look pretty different from yours. And of course, um, with international things, any of you who have traveled or even have done something like come to college if you're from a different area of the country or um, even a different town like it can be kind of a culture shock um, I'm from Michigan and I still have some trouble sometimes um, with navigating life in the south so thinking about how you have been resilient how you have followed through in the face of obstacles so thinking about the ways that you have um, that ability to adapt and to keep going when things get a little shaky and then finally, um, a unique perspective on the world's biggest problems. We have, what, 19 people in here. We have 19 different perspectives on the world's biggest problems. And really, they're hoping to learn more about you and your ideas so that they can see kind of where you might go with them. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and pause before we invite Alexis on. Are there any questions? Feel free to type them in the chat or to unmute yourself.
All right. Okay. All right. Well, I um, am happy to stop talking for right now. Um, I'm going to bring Alexis or ask her to, I was going to say bring her up, but I guess ask her to unmute herself and share her screen or her camera. Um, and so basically, I'm just interested, um, Alexis, in hearing more about your experience and what it was like applying for the DAD RISE, what the DAD RISE is, and what your experience was like. Yes, of course. Um, so I applied for DAD RISE um, fall of my sophomore year. Um, I worked with Heidi and she wrote my letters with me. DAD RISE, we're lucky, is kind of an easier application out of the fellowships that we have. Um, so it was basically just a cover letter explaining why you were applying to the project you were applying to. You could apply to up to three different projects in three different um, German cities. And then I heard back in March that I was going to be in Berlin for the summer. Um, I loved my time in Berlin. I would say that my biggest takeaway was that it was like an international fellowship. It wasn't so much about the research for me as it was immersing myself in the culture of Berlin, immersing myself in like a different academic environment. I definitely, um, and I talked to other um, DAD RISE recipients about this. There's definitely a different work culture in Europe. Like we would have like a dog in the lab sometimes, or like there were no set times that you had to be there and just everything felt much more um, relaxed, I think. So I really enjoyed it as a summer job. Um, and for the most part, I was only there four days a week. So I had like three day weekends to travel and kind of see Europe. I went to six other countries while I was there this summer. So I really, really enjoyed um, that aspect of it, of getting to see more of the world. Um, and then as for my research, like it was very um, kind of like build your own. So he let me kind of say what I wanted to do, what I wanted out of it. And then um, I was able to um, interact with participants. The great thing about Germany is English is not an issue for almost anyone. Um, so they would come in and they would have no problem speaking English with me. Um, I was doing cognitive um, psychology research using eye tracking techniques, um, which is something that I had experience with from my um, research here at South Carolina. So I do think that that's kind of what gave me the edge into getting that project. Um, and the other great thing that I would just mention about DAD RISE is that they do uh, one weekend where they get all the recipients together in Germany. So I got to meet other American and Canadian recipients um, and just kind of get to hear about their different projects. And DAD RISE just has so many cool projects. Like there was another girl, if you're interested in marine biology, she was literally positioned on a boat and swimming with seals for the whole summer. You know, there are so many different really cool projects that you can do. Um, in addition to just getting to spend the summer in Europe. Really. Thank you. And I also wanted to um, call out, we have Ever Curry in the room as well. She's another one of our fellowship peer mentors. Um, so she uh, participated on a domestic research experience, but is also applying for um, an international award this, this uh, semester. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit, introduce yourself, Ever, and then we'll kind of go back and forth with questions. Yeah, so hi, I'm Ever. I'm a senior here. Um, and so like Heidi was saying, I applied for one of the domestic awards where I was at an REU this past summer in Minnesota. But I've also been working through my application and applying for the US Fulbright. And so this is the one that she mentioned that you will typically be applying for your senior year right before you're graduating. Um, and so I have just submitted my preliminary application in August. So if you have any questions on how that process is going and how it how international competitions differ from national competitions when it comes to the content that they need, uh, feel free to contact me just to get some information on that. Thank you. And um, and Ever, just to, to clarify for the folks in the room, so you do biology research, but you're actually applying for English teaching, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So again, those connections. Um, so for our fellowship peer mentors, um, what was uh, most helpful to you when you were thinking about applying for fellowships? What kind of resources did you use? 
I, I would say my meetings with you were the most helpful, to be honest. Um, I didn't end up meeting with a fellowship peer mentor, but now I am one myself. So I would like to plug that as well. I do think that, that would be helpful. Um, I just didn't happen to do that when I was applying. I second that very much. Um, coming, going into me, the fellowship team, especially because they're so willing to, you just kind of say what you want to do and they, they kind of pull things for you. It's like, okay, well, if you want to do this, then maybe try this. And a lot of the avenues that they kind of open up for you is very, very important and very helpful into deciding exactly what you want to do and what you want to apply for. Yeah. And um, how is the application writing process for you? Because I know it can seem a little bit daunting to write all of these essays and cover letters and do this research. Um, what advice do you have to kind of address that, that a little bit of overwhelm that can come with looking at applying for fellowships? You wanna go Alexis or do you want me to go? Yeah, um, I would just say the earlier you get started, the better. I feel like looking into which fellowship I wanted to apply early in the semester and then knowing when that application opened and having my meeting set, like just taking it step by step, sort of. Um, that's what I found to be most helpful. Yeah, I definitely didn't do that. I definitely rushed a lot of my stuff. So please don't do that. It's a very bad idea. Um, with a lot of like the personal statements, you really have to understand what you want. I think that was the biggest thing for me. It was like, what do I want? And then also like, how do I see myself? Like, who am I? Um, because being able to sell yourself in your personal statements is going to be probably like one of the biggest things is why do you want this and why is it this specific thing with this country or with this research and this program? Why is it this? And it, it should reflect you. And so when you were kind of planning out your fellowships, journey um how did you get started what did that process look like for you when kind of figuring out what you were going to do and what you were going to do next yeah I feel like I had it very simple um I first heard about fellowships through the U101 meeting or the U101 presentations um so it was in the back of my head when then sophomore year I knew I was interested in going abroad I just kind of clicked on the database and was looking at the abroad ones and I saw that one was in Germany and my other study abroad was ending in Germany. So I was just like, oh, that one. But it's not always that easy. I just think that um, definitely utilizing that database is helpful. Yeah, I heard about fellowships my freshman year, um, but I didn't actually apply to my sophomore year. Um, so it was definitely something that I just didn't really understand fully. And it wasn't until I actually went to the fellowship team to be like, what is this? What are you all talking about? It wasn't until then I actually figure out what I was going to do or what I wanted to do. So. Wonderful. And um, if you had kind of one piece of advice to give, give folks, I know you said like start early, go see the fellowships team. But do you have any other um, pieces of advice for folks who are wondering if this is for them or not? I guess one thing is, um, and this is something that my mom always told me, was like, don't tell yourself no. When you're like looking at all these uh, different types of awards and yes, applications and you think that you need these specific credentials, you need to know how to do this research and have these classes already taken. It's important for you to realize that if you tell yourself no first, then you'll never know if you even stood a chance, right? And so when you set aside that fear of not being enough and not having enough, like when you're applying and on your resumes, it makes it so much better because it'll open up all your all these opportunities that might actually come to you. You just didn't know because you were selling yourself a bit too short. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I definitely didn't think that I was going to win my fellowship. I was like planning my whole summer around not winning it. Um, so don't doubt yourself. Just just have faith that sometimes things do work out. Um, and as long as you, you know, put your best effort into your application, like Heidi said before, you get a lot out of that process, regardless if you win it or not. Um, so it's always a good idea to try. Thank you. Y'all are like inspiring me to apply for something. <laughs> I'm telling you, if I ever leave this job, it's going to be because I applied to Erasmus Mundus and went off to Europe to earn another master's. Um, yeah, so 
again, if you don't apply, the answer is always no. Um, so we're happy to talk through kind of what the answer could be or um, what things you might learn about yourself in the process. So, um, and feel free to put uh, questions in the chat or to raise your hand if you have a question. But speaking of kind of what you said, Alexis, what's something you learned about yourself during the process that surprised you? Um, I think that for me, I hadn't had like a lot of independence in my research before. And so being thrust in that situation where it was like, kind of work on your own and do this and that I realized that I actually do know more than I thought and I'm capable of um, doing more of an independent research project, um, which is good to know for the future. Um, and just in general, I think independence is a huge part of the DAD RISE program because again, I was in Germany not really knowing anyone. Um, so even if I had thought that before, I definitely, definitely know now how much I'm capable of doing on my own. All right, does anyone have any other questions for our fellowship peer mentors? Awesome. Well, if you do, um, I will show you kind of as, as we wrap up here um, where you can find their contact information and where you can request coffee with either Ever or Alexis or one of our other fabulous peer mentors, depending on what you're interested in. So thank you, Ever and Alexis, for sharing your story. So it's really great. All right, so um, just some tips. You already got some expert tips from the pros over there, but thinking about how to craft a strong application. So first off, you wanna make sure that you're finding your fit. So again, it's all about finding which fellowship is gonna be the right fit for you. Um, we do have, again, over 250 different opportunities. We do have a search engine, which again, I'll show you in just a second, but it does help to come in and talk with us because we might um, have some ideas or maybe put things together in a way that you hadn't considered that can open up um, more opportunities. So really find which fellowship fits. Um, time to go back to the, the yes, no sort of thing. If it's not a like a yes, I'm interested in that, it's usually a no and we can help you kind of figure out that process because you want to be applying for fellowships that are really going to help you do what you want to do. Because I mean, y'all got stuff to do. Y'all are busy. You have lives. We need to help you invest your time wisely. Um, start early. Again, it's never too early to start. It's rarely too late to start. Um, so definitely come and see us when you're interested in fellowships. Um, if you like to plan ahead, it's always good to start a bit early. Um, but again, deadlines vary. A lot of them are in the fall. Some of them are in the spring. It just kind of depends. Um, so definitely come and talk with us and we'll help you figure out kind of what your plan is for going forward. Again, grab coffee with a fellowship peer mentor. Get to know your faculty. So especially for those of you who are first or second year students, um, faculty can seem kind of intimidating, but try going to their office hours or asking questions in class, or um, you can do a little bit of Googling or like searching them up online and um, seeing what their research areas are and asking them questions about it. People love to talk about themselves and their interests. And if you ask them questions, they are more than happy to share information nine times out of 10. So definitely start forming those faculty relationships, not only because they can provide mentorship, they can help you explore new avenues, they can offer advice, but also for a lot of these applications, you will need letters of recommendation from people who know you pretty well. Um, so they don't have to be like your best friend and that would be a little weird anyways, but um, faculty who can really speak to your ability to do the things you wanna do, to do the research, to teach English, to do study, um, so really starting to build those relationships early is a good call. And they really do want you to focus on depth over breadth. So it's good that you've done like 50 different clubs in college, but I mean, what, what did you get the most out of? What have you done the most of? So if you did 50 clubs, was it that you really, um, the one you invested the most time in was, I don't know, uh, spaying and neutering cats? there you go. Maybe you want to be a veterinarian and you can talk about um, the depth of your experience. And that also helps if you haven't done 50 clubs and you've done maybe three because you really have concentrated. So really think about the depth over breadth when you're thinking about what's going to make you a strong applicant. Demonstrating your interests. So telling the your story about what you're interested in, where that interest comes from, what you hope to do with that, and really being clear about it. Because again, um, 
this is all about persuasive writing and interviewing, and we can help you to kind of find your authentic voice and really speak to what makes you excited. Um, and this is one thing I didn't ask our um, two fellowship peer mentors, but uh, what was the feedback process like for you? Did you start with your, uh, did you end with the first draft you started with? Ever or Alexis? No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think mine went through, with my advisor, I think it went through, I, I honestly think, I had more corrections of my own than he did. After, this, after my third one, he was like, all right, this is this is great. You can go straight to committee. Um, <laughs> but definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So feedback is a really important part of the process. And it's really important, an important part of being a good writer is being able to ask people what they think and then to be open to that feedback. Um, very, very, very rarely, if ever, does anyone's first draft, like, stay their final draft, like, very rarely. Um, so as part of the feedback process, you can meet with um, our team. We're happy to offer feedback on your essays, suggestions for strengthening it, or where you can focus, or how you can frame um, your different experiences. So being open and willing to engage in those types of conversations, even when maybe you don't like what you're hearing, or maybe you're hearing three contradicting opinions, like that's going to be a really important part of this process. So being open to feedback. And I think one of the other things that has come up a lot is folks are kind of intimidated by the writing portion. Um, if you're not the strongest writer, that's okay. Um, we are here again to help you find your voice and tell your story. You also have um, the Writing Center, Grammarly, things like that, that can really help you to um, put forth a polished application. And again, it's about your fit for the fellowship and your interest in your passions over and above anything else. Using your resources like the fellowship peer mentors, our team, your advisors. Um, so definitely reach out to us. So I'm gonna ask you a um, couple of questions. So I want you to think about one fellowship that sparked your interest today. You can put it in the chat if you can remember the, the titles um, or just the themes of what sparked your interest. And then what's one step that you'll that you will take in the next two weeks to follow up on that curiosity? All right. Ooh, we got IT one, CLS. Awesome. One, one. Going to an appointment, meeting with a peer mentor, CLS awesome. CLS from Fulbright UK. Awesome. Y'all are my people. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So that's a great fellowship to start with. Again, that's one that's a really cool experience, especially if you're interested in language learning and you want to learn that language really well. <laughs> it's a great experience. Um, yeah. And research more of the fellowships offered. Awesome. Yeah. So you may ask yourself, how do we, how do you get involved? How do you start with this? So how to get started is our next, our next slide. So First off, explore your options with Info. Info is our searchable database of fellowship options. Um, again, we have a lot of fellowship options, but you can actually filter them by your year for funding, by your interests, by your major, um, what you want to do. It's a really great resource. Check out our workshops. You found your way here. So um, keep looking at our event calendars and we'll host workshops that are more um, specific to certain fellowships or we'll host general info sessions like we're doing tonight. Uh, third, make an appointment with us. Um, we are on Navigate. If you are an undergrad, um, we're under involvement and engagement. You can meet with any of our fellowship advisors. We do again have those areas of specialization, but we are all cross-trained. So we have enough knowledge to be dangerous about every award. Um, and if we're not the person, um, the point person for that award, we'll direct you to who who you'll need to work with once you kind of come into our office, get familiar with um, our fellowships and kind of decide which path you want to take. If you are a graduate student or graduating senior, um, you'll use Calendly. And again, that'll be on our website on the um, Getting Started page, which I'm going to take you to in just a second. And you can schedule an appointment that way. And finally, um, complete your candidate profile. So your candidate profile is a little bit of information that you give us that puts you into our database. We promise not to spam you. We'll send you one email a week um, and you can actually customize the type of information you wanna receive. So if you're really interested in international fellowships, 
you'll get information about that if you let us know. If you're interested in public service, um, graduate school, research, we have a bunch of different areas. Or if you just want to hear about one specific fellowship, you can let us know. That way you're not getting bombarded with um, STEM research opportunities when you are trying to study music, which I don't know, maybe those go together for you, but not always. So that'll help us customize your um, experience. All right. Wonderful. Okay, so I said I was going to show you our website. So I'm going to stop my share. If you have any questions, um, feel free to unmute or throw it in the chat while I pull this up. See if my internet will work. Right. And I see um, someone mentioned Fulbright in the chat. If you are thinking of Fulbright and you want to be abroad on Fulbright next year, now is the time to get started. So please come see me as soon as you can. Um, so, all right, sharing my screen. Okay, so this is our National Fellowships website, National Fellowships and Scholar Programs. So this is where you're going to find all of that information I was talking about, about getting started, about our database, and you're going to find that under the National Fellowships um, sidebar. And here is some information about fellowships, but getting started is going to be where you'll want to go. So this gives you the link to our database, our upcoming workshops, also recorded information sessions, um, the link to make an appointment, and again, to complete that candidate profile. So this is going to be um, a really important page for you when you're first starting out and can help you keep in touch with our office. Once you're ready to start doing some research, um, you can look at our fellowships database. And again, you can see there are filters. There are 276 entries, so you might want to use these. But for example, um, if you are interested in health sciences and you want to do something I don't know, study abroad, why not? See what they have. So you can actually combine different parameters as well. So Gilman, Boren, Bridging, a lot of the ones we talked about. Um, so this will give you some opportunities to look at that might be a good fit for you. Um, again, sometimes the search feature gets a little funky. So you may want to also just like take a few minutes and browse and see um, what's out there. And then again, come talk to our our team members because we're we know our database pretty well and can help direct you um, when the search feature fails. So lots of really cool opportunities here. And each of these fellowships will um, have, as you can see, I brought up even more, um, we'll have a program page that gives you more information, links to the fellowship website, and an idea about the deadline. So Gilman again, deadline is coming up on October 5th. So if you're interested in that, please do give us a shout and come on over. And if you are interested in having coffee with a peer mentor, again, you can find it over on this side of the page, Fellowship Peer Mentors. And here you can request a coffee chat and see who all you can chat with. So as you can see, we have a ton of folks and familiar faces up here, um, but you can kind of filter this depending on what you're interested in. Um, so our computer science folks, we had Ellen McBride who did a Department of Defense cyber scholarship. Um, PPIA, um, Summer Honors Program, so lots of different ones. Research, um, again, familiar faces, environment, and any of these folks are ready and willing to talk to you about their experiences. So again, lots of great resources, but your first step is to um, just start that candidate profile and make an appointment with our team. All right, so let's see. Any other questions? We have four minutes left. I think I actually booked an hour and a half for this, but four minutes left. So y'all can have some of your evening thing. All right. Yeah, well, I expect to see all of you folks who are interested in CLS to come into our office in the next couple of weeks. Um, very excited to talk to you about that. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, and just stay in touch. Um, we love to work with students and 
we have lots of opportunities and lots of people who want to give you money. So we're happy to connect you there. I will just finish with sharing my contact information um, and a QR code if you can let us know what you thought. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.